Hey there, it's Jason Gorman from Codemanship with another video diary entry. Uh, before we begin, if you're enjoying these videos, please uh, like and subscribe and ring the bell for notifications for new content. Okay, so every, every now and again, I like to throw the cat among the pigeons with a very simple question that I'll post on social media um, about where we assign responsibilities for the, the actions that our software performs. And this is usually a, a question about object-oriented versus procedural or functional programming, but more generally about responsibilities. Where do we assign responsibilities for the work that our software does? And um, it's usually creates um, quite a lot of fuss because people have some quite strong ideas about this um, in one way or another. Um, the uh, the uh, example I often illustrate with is one taken from the, the Codemanship Codecraft and TDD courses called the CD Warehouse Exercise, where uh, uh, participants were asked to test drive some code um, for a, an online CD retailer, basically. And one of the functions they have to implement is buying a CD, so customers can buy CDs. And Typically, we come up with a, 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 quite a range of different uh, designs that essentially do the same thing. I'm illustrating one here with this code that's in front of us for buying a CD. So we've got a couple of tests um, where we create our CD with an initial stock of 10 and a price of 9.99. Um, and then we create a customer, okay? And we set up a credit card, which is a, a stub, it's fake. Um, so when we call the credit card and ask it to, to pay um, for the amount that we're gonna charge, um, we're faking the response. We say, well, in this test, the payment's going to be accepted. And then we call a buy method on the customer class. So it reads customer.buyCD, basically. And to a lot of people, this makes sense. Customers buy CDs. Okay, so it reads nice uh, and, and easy. Um, and then we check at the end that the, the, uh, the sell quantity of two is deducted from that initial stock. And then we've got a second test where we're, we're using a mock credit card to test how much we're actually um, charging the customer's card with that pay method. Now, the reason I'm showing you this version first is because this is typically the one or along these lines that participants will come up with. And from having this conversation many, many times, it's one a lot of programmers prefer because it makes sense to them in the real world. Customer dot buy CD, customer buy CD makes perfect sense. It scans well. Um, but it has one major drawback. Um, and if we take a look at our code here, we can see, hopefully, um, if we go into our customer class that's doing this work, this method here has what we call feature envy. Feature envy is a code smell that is discussed in Martin Fowler and Ken Beck's book on, uh, Ken Beck's book on refactoring um, called feature envy, which is when a method or part of a method of one class has envy for the features of another class, giving a strong indication that this code is in the wrong class. So what we've got is lots of low level coupling between customer and CD, and this can become a major problem. And if we take a look at CD itself, it's just data and getters and setters. It doesn't do anything. It's what we call a data class. Data classes are another code smell very closely related to feature envy that, um, that's discussed in the refactoring book. Wherever you see data classes, you can bet your bottom dollar there's going to be some feature envy on the, uh, the fields of that class somewhere else in the code, creating massive amounts of low-level coupling. So every time we try to change the, the schema of the CD, um, we end up having to rewrite a lot of other modules. So generally speaking, it's not good modular design. It's certainly not good object-oriented design because one of the, the foundation, sort of founding principles of object-oriented design is that objects should encapsulate the details of how they work. For example, they should hide their data from the clients that use them. The less modules know about each other, the better, basically, because the less chance there is that when we cho change the internal workings of one module, we're going to have to start rewriting a bunch of other modules that are very closely coupled to it. So it's not a great design. If we wanted to fix this design, Really, we want to move this by method to where it really belongs. So let's move by method to CD and see what happens. Okay, off it goes. So now it's inside the CD. I'm just going to rerun my tests um, to make sure that that works. Um, and this get and set stop, we can, we can start inlining these. Let's inline that. Okay, and remove the method. Okay, and we'll need to keep get stop because we're using it in the test but we don't need get price. So let's inline get price and get rid of it. So we've, you can see that now that I've moved the buy method to 
CD, I can start hiding things from everyone else. So I can hide the price, I can hide the ability to set the stock so no one else can set the stock. Um, get stock we need to re uh, retain, but I can inline it here, but just keep the method so the test still works. Um, hang on a minute. Is that what I said? Inline this and only and keep the method. That's the one. Okay. So we're starting to hide the internal details of, of CD and how it works and how buying a CD works. And we end up with a, a much cleaner design. And in actual fact, in our tests now, we don't really need to involve customer at all. Customer, as you can see, is now is now redundant. So we can do a, a safe delete on that and get rid of customer um, from our code. In fact, if I just do a delete of the, oops, no, do a safe delete. Let's see if we can bring that up there. There we go. Alt delete, that's the shortcut. It's been a while since I've been working in IntelliJ. Um, okay, and uh, we can get rid of those as well. Alt delete. So customer does not need to be involved. It's redundant. So the other effect of moving that responsibility to where it really belongs, arguably, is that we've made customer redundant. So let's do a safe delete on that because no one else is using customer. So, so we reduce the coupling in our design, but we also simplify the design typically when we encapsulate better. And very often on the, um, the training course, I will encourage people to do this kind of refactoring and then ask them, is your code now simpler? Is there less coupling? And they will agree that, that it is. It's simpler. There's, there's less coupling, but they still don't like it. And the reason they don't like it is because cd.buy makes no sense to them. CDs don't buy themselves in the real world. Therefore, cd.buy doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I see this a lot and I've seen it a lot over the last 30 years. Um, and I think it's because people are reading object-oriented code wrong. They're reading it backwards. The thing is, cd.buy does not, the way I read it at least, does not mean um, the CD is buying, we're telling the CD to buy something, it means buy this CD. So the CD at the beginning essentially means this CD, apply this action to this object. Hence, in my opinion, object-oriented programming, apply this action to this object. So if you read it that way, CD.buy means buy this CD, um, then object-oriented code makes perfect sense. Then they say, but uh, what about the responsibility? What work is CD doing? This is purely syntactical. This is purely a convention that in, um, in object-oriented programming, we organize the functions that act on our objects inside the classes where the data is essentially, we encapsulate it. So it doesn't really mean that the CD is buying anything. In reality, the CD is not buying anything. What we've done is we've grouped all the functions that apply to a CD into the same class or the same module. This is how we would do it, for example, if we were trying to write good, um, object-oriented code, which by the way you can, if you know what you're doing, good object-oriented code written in a language like C that doesn't directly support classes, but you can follow a convention of saying, well, look, here's the data structure. Here's our CD data structure with the stock and the price. Here are all the functions that apply to that CD data structure. Let's put them all in the same file. Um, and let's not define this data structure so it's visible to any other files, any other modules. Let's define it in the implementation and just have it as an abstract type, basically, in the header file so that people can only see there is such a thing as a CD, but they don't know that it has a stock and a price. And then we can write the functions for talking, uh, for, for manipulating CDs in the same file. And a convention you might follow is for each of those functions that applies to a CD, you might pass the CD in as the first parameter and maybe call it something like self or this. And this is where this convention comes from. If we take a look inside our CD, you can see this dot stock, this dot price. And this, if we go back to our, that's referring to that. CD here in this code is referring to the exact same instance of CD as this is referring to in this code here. So that's how I read it. CD.buy means buy this CD. And when you read it that way, OO code makes a lot more sense. When you try to flip it around and say, well, we, we, you know, we need something to buy the CD, a customer, for example, um, or we do shop.sell CD or something like that, you end up creating lots of low-level coupling between those objects. You're separating the work from the data that's required. And I've got going to illustrate what can go wrong here 
with a little slide that I knocked up very quickly just now. Um, so think of a, a professional kitchen in a, in a high-end restaurant. And in that kitchen, there'll be a bunch of different workstations for preparing different kinds of food, a workstation for preparing fish, a workstation for making pastry and so on and so forth. And each of these workstations requires its own utensils, each of these jobs, if you like, um, preparing fish, filleting fish, for example, you can't really do that um, with a roller. Um, and um, you don't really need to fill it, or hopefully you don't need to fill it um, pastry, because um, there shouldn't be any bones in it. Um, so each each kind of food requires, each job, if you like, requires its own special utensils. Now, you've got a choice about where you can keep these utensils. It would make most sense from the perspective of simplifying the overall system in the kitchen to put keep the utensils at the workstations where they will be used. Um, so think of the workstations as being classes, the utensils as data, and the chefs or the jobs that the chefs are doing as the functions that act with that data basically the idea is to bring them all together so we don't have a situation where where in a busy kitchen chefs are constantly having to go back and forth between different workstations to get all of the utensils they need instead you put the put the utensils where the work is and it's the same in good object oriented design and good modular design generally put the work where the data is or put the data where the work is you can do it either way around and to illustrate what i mean by that um, I've got another version of the same tests, but in this version, the work that's being done here is being done inside the, the test. The, the responsibility hasn't been assigned to any object yet, except of course inside the test. So we haven't decided yet who is doing this and on what basis would we make that decision? How would we decide where this belongs? Um, well, you need to look at the work that's being done and you need to look especially at the data that's being used and one way to do that might be to extract this little block of work into its own method let's call it by um, and it's, it's showing you okay in order for this to work we're going to need all of these parameters we need all of this data basically to do this job and it sees the other version clever old IntelliJ how I've missed you um, so when we look at this by method it's and the parameters in it it's telling us this is what you need, basically, in order to do this job. These are the utensils that you need in order to prepare this dish, if you like. Um, and so we can use that as the basis for object design. We can say, well, we could create a class, for example, that has a stock and a price, and we can give it the credit card details and the quantity that we're buying in, in, as parameters of the buy method itself, because they're, they're transient. They will change over the lifetime of that CD. Um, so we can imagine an object that has a stock and a price, and you can buy it not it buys you buy it and then we package them all together and we end up essentially with something very similar to our cd class and i do this quite often this is a, a style of tdd called tdd as if you really mean it um which was invented by uh, keith braithwaite um and um, it's a very good way of visualizing this 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 process of assigning responsibilities to objects as you refactor the code by not making those decisions up front and if i just undo this now um, let's uh, get it working again. Let's just rerun our tests. There's one final point I want to make. Very often in these um, little social media posts that I use to throw the cat among the pigeons and get the clicks, we all love the clicks, um, I will make the point that all of these styles of design, all of these three examples, let's go back through them again. So there's our one, oh, I refactored that one. Uh, okay, never mind. But the one where it was customer.buyCD and the one where it's cd.buy and this one here where there is no customer and there is no CD, we haven't assigned the responsibility. I just want to make this final point. Look at those assertions, look at those test assertions. Even though they all have quite different designs, or in the case of this one, no design at all, except for the, the code that does the work, even though they have quite different designs, they all achieve identical results. And when I say to people, this code and this code and this code all mean the same thing, that's what I'm talking about. They have identical results. They do the exact same work. They may do it in different ways, but they achieve the exact same results. They are all logically equivalent, but arguably some of those logically equivalent designs 
will have advantages over others. And one advantage is greater encapsulation, lower coupling and greater simplicity. So I urge developers to let go of the, oh, but CDs don't buy themselves. Let go of that. That's not what, that's not how you read it. CD.buy does not mean the CD is buying. It means buy this CD. CD dot means this CD. We're identifying the thing in memory, the record, the data structure, um, whatever it is, we're identifying the thing in memory to which this action is to be applied. And then we group those functions into the same file as where that, that data is defined, where that object is defined, to create the complete object with data and behavior, data and behavior. And that's really what we mean by encapsulation. Okay, so there's there's another cat thrown among some more pigeons. Um, I'm sure you all have thoughts on this. This never goes unquestioned um, or unargued. So by all means, let me know in the comments below. Um, until the next video diary, uh, take care and stay safe.